this was a case of uh, sir uh, uh, fracture uh, pelvic fracture with uh, posterior urethral uh, distraction injury sir let, let us go to the mcu films rgu mcu films let's begin from there yes sir uh, the uh, this is the retrograde uh, urethrogram film uh, we showing can see it. if we can't see it yet share again Uh, uh, show, showing a, a fracture of the left uh, in uh, uh, supra uh, supra pubic and infra pubic rami and uh, see they are not referred to as supra pubic and infra pubic they are referred <laughs> to as superior and inferior Sorry, or sir. horizontal and vertical yes sir uh, superior infra pubic rami fracture uh, and uh, uh, there is a retro uh, uh, there is a contrast seen in the anterior urethra uh, going uh, uh, with uh, well distended uh, with the well distended anterior urethra up till the uh, proximal bulbar urethra uh, with coning of the uh, contrast seen the uh, contrast is not seen uh, not seen uh, entering uh, the prostatic uh, or the bladder sir prostatic urethra or the bladder do you think that the coning is normal here uh, No sir. You said uh, you see. Uh, sir, uh, uh, this uh... the best way to describe this. There's an abrupt, abrupt but level of proximal urethra, and the normal bulbar cone is not seen. Yes. No bulbar cone. Yes. it stands to reason that in a patient like this who has got his injury and fractures and spc that uh, by the way what is the commonest type of injury that you see let me just ask you that which is the commonest injury that you see a uh, cell bulbo membrana sir type man the mckellen colapinto classification the gold with the goldman modification which is the type that is commonly seen Sir, uh, type two, sir, partial. I think we'll go to read that stuff also. <laughs> That's right. Last week, Doctor Manish told you to read something. Sir. Yes, sir. So you need to read that. So there's an abrupt cut off, and the bulbar cone is not seen. The normal bulbar cone is a very characteristic radiological finding. Okay. Yes, sir. What are the attachments of the urogenital diaphragm? I'm going to play with it. Let me get to it. So, okay, read that up also. How many layers did the urogenital diaphragm have? Le levels, sir. No, what is? How many layers does it have? Since you do not know the attachment, I'm asking another question. How many layers does it have? No sir, the attachment sir is to pubic uh, rami sir. Uh, yes, sir. Carry on, come on, carry on. <laughs> the perineum was a very dark structure during our anatomy dissection, and you, even a cadaver, you hardly saw anything. So, it's only in my situation that we are able to see all this. Anyway, so what are you going to do now? What more do you want? Are you happy with this X-ray? Uh, the lateral film, uh, would, uh, uh, oblique film, uh, would have uh, uh, would have better appreciated uh, the length uh, and the uh, uh, red. Anything else that you would have liked to be better? Maybe it can be better. Maybe it can't. But do you like anything else to be better?
So whenever there is an obstruction like this, proximally, and a retrograde is done, we expect the penile urethra to be well distended. You yes. see normal urethrograms. In this yes. urethrogram, it's not even as well distended as in a normal urethrogram. But one of the reasons for this is that there is not enough filling. The second reason is that there might be a fibrotic process extending along the length of the urethra, which may not be related to the injury, but might have pre-existed the injury. Yes, sir. So, sir, uh, does the urethra does not look uh, well distended in this urethrogram, sir? You have to make your mind up, uh, Sara. Yes, sir. Please look at normal urethrograms. Look at this. What is the normal diameter? What is the normal diameter that you norm you expect? Uh, what is the normal diameter that you expect? Uh, sir, uh, the uh, neutral is a uh, twenty-four French. Uh, the uh, so what is it? Twenty-four divided by three. Eight, sir. Eight. If you measure the width of that on the on the standard X-ray, if you have a digital X-ray, you should be able to mark it out and make out whether it is eight millimeters or less. That's all. If it is not, and you think that the amount of contrast that is not appropriate needs to be redone, then you redo it and see whether there is anything else. Yes, sir. You see, if there is an abrupt cutoff at the level of the bulbar urethra, and the so-called penile urethra is well distended, then that little curve bend that you see at the level of the penosporal junction should have also been sort of fully distended, the same caliber as the penile urethra. So when Dr. Mohan asked you, what else would you like? You say, I would like to outline that area better. I just want to make sure that that area is not compromised and that is also is just a radiological artifact. It is due to the effect of the injection. And that is simply because of the fact that this guy who's done the x-ray has put his finger there. If, yes. you, if you use the clamp and you do it properly, then you get a uniform distension and that's the advantage. The advantage is you get a uniform filling and here you get, you see what happens, you just push here. And the amount of push you is, is going to be very variable when you shoot the X-ray. So, and get your hand also in the way. So you have to make sure that that part of the urethra, which is appears to be a little, you know, is not irregular. It is a smooth. Yes, sir. smooth. I don't have the point of it's okay. Can you see that? No, yeah, I don't think you can. But yeah, yeah. But yes, exactly. That that's where it is. That little because you compare the diameter of that and the penile urethra, there's a little difference, isn't it? Yes, sir. So you on that and then explain as to whether you think that this is a pathological narrowing or is it just a, one of those radiological uh, situations, that's all. So what else do you want to do now? Sir, I want to ask sort of one question. Yes, what sir. is the difference in uh, the doing an RGU in a patient who has a cutoff like this compared to another person where the contrast is entering the blood? As a person who is doing this, do you uh, need to be any difference in the technique or anything? Uh, it can be a gravity or an incremental uh, urethrogram if you are suspecting to be a urethral injury there. So there is a chance of extravasation and uh, uh, further uh, in, uh, introduction of an infection can be prevented. Hello, that was not the question. This patient has come after three months. Three months. You are doing a urethrogram now. In your preliminary exposure of film, you see the contrast entering the ladder in one film. In another patient, similar situation, you don't see contrast entering the bladder. Is there any difference in the technique of doing the urethrogram that you will adopt? That was the question Dr. Prabhu is asking you. Uh, no, sir. What problems can you face when doing an RGU? 
is it a simple technique you just do it and it's over or you see some complications occurring during the progress you need to keep your crash cart ready when you're doing it extra machine <laughs> extra machine doesn't cause any doesn't need any crash crash cart right so we refer to it as intravasation because it happens within the confines of the body but there can be intravasation of contrast which will manifest either as acute pain during the procedure if the contrast goes in high volumes will manifest as a radiologic finding or can result in bacteremia and hypotension almost immediately Yes, which is why these procedures are taken seriously. We follow aseptic precautions, and Dr. Prabhu's specific question was with respect to the pressure that thumb will apply on the barrel of the on the piston of the syringe. If you find there is an obstruction and there is resistance, you won't push all the way. If you find that the contrast is going in without resistance or with minimal resistance, you might push all the way so that the entire urethra can be delineated. and what we are seeing in this x ray that can that doubt can be eliminated wasting of some portion of the pinnable bar junction the other maneuver which will help avoid this kind of uh, interpretation is stretching the penis so that even if it's folded at the pinnable bar junction in its resting stage when we stretch it mildly the pinnable bar junction gets straightened out <coughs> yes So what is this gapometry? We discussed it. Did you read about? Ah, uh, gapometry is the uh, it, uh, rough estimate of the uh, uh, which gives a rough estimate whether the primary anastomosis can be done uh, or we need a further mobilization uh, or. Uh, when the word metry is used, that is the measurement. Yes, sir. Uh, is the measure of the uh, uh, distance between the two uh, between the of the defect divided by the uh, distance of the uh, bulbar uh, of the uh, measurement of the bulbar urethra? If it is less than one third or point three five, uh, the primary anastomosis would uh, be uh, can be done uh, a, with the uh, and uh, if it is more than uh, one third, uh, we would likely uh, be using a. a Uh, pubectomy needing a pubectomy uh, inferior pubectomy or corporal rerouting sir extra as a extra procedure not wholly correct uh, sir okay. see when you you are doing a primary anastomosis you can't say when you are doing the primary you have to do a primary anastomosis because this is a fresh case isn't yes, it sir. yes sir yes so, sir in a primary anastomosis there are certain maneuvers which are achieved by doing certain techniques to get the length because the gap has to be bridged and can yeah. you do entirely through the perineum or can you do this by a combined abdominal perineal approach is what this gapometry index tells you about all right yes sir these maneuvers are necessary to achieve a primary end to end anastomosis from the perineum It's a very long defect. Then you may have to go for an abdominal perineal procedure or an elaborated approach. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Suppose in RG you find uh, there's a bone spicule in the urethra, in the line of the urethra, yes. probably it's in the urethra. So, what are your concerns, sir? There are some fragments. Can either enter the bladder, it can enter the prostate, or it can enter the urethra. The fragment first has to be taken care of uh, before the anastomosis uh, is being done, sir. So, let's say. Oh, how do you take care of the fragment? Put it back where it came from. They remove it, sir. Ah, why don't you simply say that the fragment has to be removed? Yeah. If it is in the bladder. So the fragment has pierced the bladder. What's the concern? Leave it alone. No, that also has to be removed, sir. The, uh, any bony fragments uh, which is uh, uh, 
which may cause further injury uh, and... Uh, the injury is over. Finish. Only fragments won't cause injury. What they'll do is produce tortuosity. Right? And they may, at a later date, compromise healing of the anastomosis or they might cause further narrowing at the place where they're impinging on the urethra, giving rise to secondary problems. The injury is all done for, though you might see the bone there, you'll usually find a zone of fibrosis around it, and the bone doesn't actually cause injury during surgery or later. So if it's in the bladder, what do you do? So we remove the fragment. How will you do? So we'll be do, uh, the patient will be having a suprabubic uh, cystostomy. Okay. Uh, through that, uh, we can... Uh, uh, the bone chisel from there? No, nice is it a f bone fragment, sir? Or a yeah, bone there, but that's a Sometimes it, you know, fracture, I mean, injury happens in whatever direction. Uh, bone might have entered the bladder. Part of the bone has entered. So what, if you leave it behind, what can happen? Further, uh, there may be deposits, uh, 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 the bladder contraction uh, will be affected for sure, and further deposition of uh, uh, which cause part of the bladder sorrow contributes yes, most to its contraction and empty? Tetrus, yes, sir. No, no, which part of the bladder? Tetrus is a layer of the bladder. Which part of the bladder? We have the trigone, we have the bladder Tri base, we have the sir, bladder the trigon, and we have the bladder roof. The trigone, sir. Which is, the the part of the the bladder. Which is the part of the bladder that contributes most to or comes in the way of injury in children, in these patients who have pelvic fractures? Which is that anatomical structure which also contributes to continence? So the bladder next. Sir. Yeah, so this, look at the way this, look at that fragment. We said that it may be a stone sitting there, but it looks as though there's one thing just lying there freely. All right? That may have impinged on the bladder neck, we don't know. So if it is impinging on the bladder neck, sometimes it can perforate through the bladder neck. So you'd have to take all these fragments out. Lying, leaving these fragments lying loosely around is, as Mohan said, going to compromise A, your anastomosis, and B, the contractility of that area, and C, this is a loose fragment, it can get infected and destroy everything that happens there. Hmm? Yes, sir. Yeah, so... Loose bits of bone, etc., need to be taken out. This has got nothing to do with the endoscope. You know, I have to open it and then take it out. Okay. You're thinking, yeah, it's probably uh, this thing, I'll put a scope and then you can't go in. No, I thought it's a loose line. Not loose, it's attached to it. Sometimes, you know, even the orthopedician would have uh, fixed the bone and then would have entered the bladder. Okay? Open. So don't hesitate to say I will do an open uh, procedure to take it out or uh, reposition it. As I said, orthopedic implant, you may not be able to remove it, but you can take the bladder out and close it properly. Yes. Just to add to what Prabhu had said, sometimes you will find that the plates are put across the pubic bones, the fractured segments, all right? Sometimes they'll have pubic uh, plates put all over the entire pelvis just to internally stabilize it. And in the in the process of actually putting these plates, especially across the pubic bone, some of them may actually go through the bladder wall anteriorly. And this part is actually fixed. Because of the pubic uh, dice, because of the accident and the hematoma, that part of the bladder gets plastered against, the anterior bladder wall gets plastered against the back of the symphysis. It would be very difficult to actually see this unless you are aware that this thing can happen. So when you do a scopy, you must be very careful that you don't miss this, especially in a patient who's got a plate sitting there. Yes. Right. So because you can't enter through the uh, urethra, you have to enter through the bladder. And then finally, when you before you do the anastomosis, it's worth checking again because you now got a patent prosthetic urethra to check again anteriorly whether this plate is actually. <coughs> on and going through the bladder wall. I've seen that happen. 
and they, you know, it can be quite uh, tricky. Take it off. All right. Yes, sir. So you have done an MCU in the same page, but it is what not voiding. Something yes. it's unable to void when the study is being conducted. Yes, sir. You have an instrument? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you so what do you do? Uh, sir, the immediate uh, uh, measure is to put a suprapubic uh on a cap. So after the anesthesia? No, no, I'm talking about uh, this is trauma. Three months later, you're doing RGMC and you've done an RG. MC is done. This is all you're getting. You tell him to wait, he's unable to wait. Sir, we plan for a primary uh, anesthesia. No, no, the, the question uh, here is will you plan for anything or will you improve the outcome of the MCU in some way? Or will you try and get more information using some other technique so that you know exactly how much gap there is? You already mentioned that the length of the gap determines the procedure. Yes, sir. Right? You can't open everything and then find that you're unable to do an anastomosis comfortably. Uh, sir, uh, in case if the bladder neck uh, is not opening or the prostatic urethra cannot be seen, uh, uh, we uh, put in a flexible... Uh, uh, scope uh, through the bladder neck uh, so that uh, the contrast can uh, pass through the bladder neck uh, and we have a better uh, delineation of the prostatic uh, urethra, sir. Okay, let us assume for discussion's sake that you don't have a flexible cystoscope. Uh, the use of alpha blocker uh, as, uh, as is also indicated, sir, we can... Uh, it, it, it is going to take a couple of hours for the alpha blocker to act, sometimes maybe days. The patient is on the radiology table. Maybe the table is in the OT, but everything is ready. You put in the contrast, he cannot void. There is an SPC. Can you see the bladder neck in some other way? using something else other than a flexible cystoscope. Can you see it with a rigid cystoscope? Uh, we can. So, uh, yes, sir, we can do it. You can a... see it. When you see the bladder neck with a rigid cystoscope, can you do something where you can instill contrast into the posterior urethra? Uh, yes, sir, we can pass in a infant feeding tube and... Infant feeding tube? Why? You try and pass a feeding tube by its side, it curls up somewhere else. And you have to go and read the length of the infant feeding tube to know whether you can do it through the cystoscope. So you have a 17 front cystoscope sheet. We can't. So what you that's what you are using right now. That's it. So how do you put the contrast? There is something else which we use. Uh, uretric, uh, uh, uretric catheter uh, can be used, sir, to manipulate, uh, to guide through the bladder neck, sir. Sorry? The, the uretric catheter. Yeah, isn't that more simple? Under vision, you pass a uretric catheter and then get contrast through it. Yes. What's the difficulty? Let us say, uh, before uh, doing the scopy, this is RGU, I mean, this is MCU, patient is unable to void. What may be the causes of the patient bladder neck not opening, contrast not visualized in the process of the What are maybe the causes? The spasm of the external sphincter because... External? Uh, the bladder neck, sir. Mm, uh, spasm. Spasm here, correct? What? The pain uh, itself uh, will cause uh, the uh, patient not to relax and that may cause... Uh, yeah, right. Correct. Yeah, I agree. Uh, then, any other causes? The contracture at the bladder neck, uh, three months have already passed by. The trauma may cause contracture. The, the presence of hematoma may cause the uh, uh, compression at the bladder neck. Sir. Sure. <coughs> 
there can be bladderneck injury also, which is, might have been missed at the time of the initial assessment, and they put in this SPC. So, we, but for you to reconstruct, you should be sure that you are like, the proximal urethra of the bladderneck with this. Why are you worried about the bladderneck in the case of pelvic fracture? The, uh, the uh, continence mechanism uh, is a uh, more like it depended on the bladder, uh, neck, uh, smooth muscles, uh, uh, because their chance, ch uh, increased chance of external with uh, sphincter injuries. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Saurav, yes, sir. we are now forcing us to ask you, what are the types of muscles at the bladder neck? So don't say, if you want to safeguard yourself, say the bladder neck muscles. Yes. What are the types of muscles present at the blood and neck? What muscle so types are present? Say so smooth muscles. Uh, Nothing else? At the blood and neck, smooth muscles. Nothing else? Read, read, read. Okay. Yes. Yeah. In an exam, if the examiner asks you the same question a second time, it means your first answer was inadequate or wrong. So think and see how you can improve on it. Read, there are beautiful diagrams about the uh, bladder neck musculature and continence mechanisms at the bladder neck. Yeah, Prabhu, please. So, uh... Sort of this bladder neck is quite high, about three centimeters above the level of symphysis. Yes. Superiorly. What may be the reason of such a kind? Of... Like here, I think it's about two centimeters. The presence of uh, the trauma and the disruption at the bladder neck itself uh, could have. Uh, and the presence of hematoma could have uh, pushed the bladder uh, uh, upwards, sir. And Where does the... Don't, don't put everything in one basket. Cause one, cause two, cause three. Go that way. What is the first cause for elevation? Supposing you do this, say, a day after the injury, and you find the bladder neck elevated, what could be the cause? The, uh, the bladder, uh, the injury at the bladder neck itself could cause... Uh, the injury, Baba, what causes it? See, something physical must be there to lift it up, isn't it? Yes, sir. The hematoma, sir. Uh, so, yes. say, the first cause is presence of an unresolved hematoma. Yes. Right? Yes. What sir. is the next possible cause? First, think of any technical causes, then we can think of anatomical causes. Supposing you put in just 50 ml of contrast in the bladder, and this is what you find. Uh, uh, a non-distended -dist bladder also? Yeah. So inadequate distension, correct? Yes, sir. Then comes the other things. A bladder that is fixed higher because the hematoma was large, or fibrosis putting the bladder in a cup, You see a patient, uh, the SPC is put by somebody in a village or somewhere. It's more on one side, of the, not in the midline. So, any issues? Or are you happy with that? You proceed. Uh, that may cause a problem in assessing the bladder neck itself, sir. Uh, the uh, suprapubic catheter in a case of pelvic trauma should be put at least uh, five centimeter above the pubic symphysis so that uh, the uh, scope is in direct in line with the uh, bladder neck and is accessible at the time of uh, surgical intervention. Uh, Saurav, Pratt yes, is answering to the point. His question was, it is placed laterally, do you have difficulty? Yes, sir, I, it might be difficult to visualize the bladder neck on anti-grade endoscopy. And yes, it is a matter. To directing the dilator 
into the bladder neck might be difficult. Finished. Why it happens, how it happens, what difficulty, elaborate. The examiner will ask you if he needs it. At this point, all the examiner will want to know is do you know to anticipate difficulties and do you know where to place the sister's uh, the, the cystotomy? Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. The minute you start giving all kinds of explanations, you are opening the field for the examiner to ask you anything and everything. Never begin an answer with an explanation. Begin an answer with a statement of fact. And if asked, give the explanation. Yes. So what do you, what corrective steps you will take in that case? The, the species put it on the lateral side, maybe left side. What corrective steps you would think of? You are, let's say you are planning surgery in another a week. You have one week time to, is the SPC in the lateral area, you proceed or you, you plan any corrective steps? Uh, if you have a flexible scope. No, I don't have one. Even if I have flexible scope, I don't have flexible. So what is it? What you remember, Saurav, yes, in every institution, flexible cystoscopes are kept in the operating theater because they're very delicate to handle and they should not be left in places where anybody can, and everybody can handle it. And secondly, as a resident, you might not get ready access to it. You as a yes. resident have been sent to do this. You yes. find that the uh, cystotomy has been placed a little lateral to the midline, somewhat lateral or lateral to the midline. Will you proceed with your surgical plan as in the normal case, or will you want to do something more before you start the urethroplasty? No, sir, I don't have the answer, sir. But I won't uh, put in a new SPC, but... Uh, okay. Sorry, let me give you a hint. He wants to know whether you will recite that cystostomy or whether you will accept that, okay, it's, it's lateral. Remember what Prabhu said, in one week you are going to do the operation and you find that this cystostomy is lateral. Will you recite it or will you accept it and plan for that uh, lateral displacement of that cystostomy and take it at the time of surgery. Sir, uh, redoing a cystostomy, I would not be doing, but at the time of surgical intervention... Why, 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 why do you not want to recite it? The purpose is being solved by the SPC as of now. At the time of surgical intervention, yes, we can make a suprapubic, uh, a, a fresh puncture and uh, get in, uh, have an SS in direct in line with the bladder neck, sir. You would like a tract to be mature or a fresh tract? A mature tract. So from, that's why I gave one week time for you. In a week time, it's not mature. What how, much, how, much, how much time you want it to mature? Three years? No, sir, 10 to 15 days at least. A good time to have the SPC tract mature for one week. It's no issues. What do we mean by maturity of a tract? Epithelization of the tract. Uh... If that alone was enough, why do we delay doing so many procedures? Epithelization is 48 hours. Maturity refers not only to epithelization of the tract, but also the stabilization of the tract yeah, on a scaffolding which is unlikely to be disrupted, thereby leading to loss of epithelial continuity once more. You get it? Yes, sir. So it's not only the epithelization, the surrounding tissues also have to reach a state of stability, which means they should be 
fibros enough, there should be enough healing there. They won't move and they won't disrupt the epithelization that is taking place. So going back to the pathology of healing, how much time does that take for fibrosis to stabilize? Sir, uh, eighty percent of uh, wound healing takes place by three three months. That's the uh, maximum strength which a. Uh, uh, so if you want to go in within ten days, see there are stages in healing, isn't it? Yes, sir. One is bridging the gap. Second is epithelialization. Third is disorganized fibrosis. Fourth is organized fibrosis, and finally, uh, what is the remodeling of the area? One to two weeks that it takes. No, no, please go and read about it. That was the catch in Dr. Prabhu's question. The earlier textbooks on urethral repair and urethral injury repair. Take up all these issues and tell us why we should do something. We should not do something. Yes. So last week I had asked the question early management. So this patient is just you know uh, a week after the trauma. So what do you want to do? A week after a trauma. Uh... With the uh, retrograde uh, uh, urethrogram not uh, going beyond the bulbar urethra, uh, no, no. these RG MCUs are done at three months. Uh, I'm talking of this patient is one week post trauma. You don't have these MCUs. They have done an RG on day one. They found there is some extravasation. They trace basically. Now the patient is with you. You are planning something. Are you planning something at one week? At one week, sir, uh, we can plan a gentle attempt at catheterization uh, with the endoscopic realignment. Uh, can be done at one week. Sort of the question is very specific, and you should be able to answer that at this point because he's given you one week time. The way to do it is: is the patient stabilized? Obviously, he is, and then. At that point, what is the treatment possible in such a patient? You could choose to leave him alone, but the question is very specific. At one week, can you do something? Sir, so, uh, endoscopic, not catheterization. No endoscopic uh, alignment. Uh, uh, so you have to use the words, man. These are all very different procedures. You can't uh, just catheterization and then proceed to the next sentence with something else because the examiner does not know what you want to do. You on one side you said catheterization, then you said primary alignment. What does that mean? There are these are very different terms, very well defined terms, and therefore you have to mention the them. Primary alignment itself can be of different ways. Correct. Yes, primary alignment can be done on day one. So these are very different terms, sir. Huh? Yes. So what will you do at one to two when the patient is stable? What is that procedure called? Sir, uh, endoscopic alignment. Uh, we cut through the scar. Uh, cut cut through lights. Sir, that's the. Uh, cut through. What is immediate primary alignment? What is early primary realignment? What is delayed realignment? And what is delayed primary realignment? I don't know, sir. Sir, go ja ke padho, yar. You you were asked this question, no? Yes, sir. So, what what is your? You didn't write the answer. Imran, I saw wrote the answer. Sir, at four to six day endoscopic supra pubic and the uh, infra uh, and through the urethra endoscopic uh, al alignment can be attempted, sir. Oh, you're saying four to six weeks. Four to six days, sir. Sorry. Everything hinges on how stable the patient is. All right. This is a major accident. 
and Dr. Mohan said immediate, primary, and delayed. All right? Yes, sir. Immediate is immediate. It means you must have a stable patient. And there are centers where they will take the patient and railroad a catheter through. All right? This yes, can sir. be done as an open operation or this can be done as an endoscopic procedure. Remembering what uh, Mr. Bob Agley, may, you may not have uh, attended those meetings, but discussing how in, in such a situation you must be extremely careful and you must have the experience to do all this. Because he quoted a patient who was for eight hours going on, they were trying to do this operation. Okay? And the yes. end of it, disaster. The idea is that you want to align the urethra so that subsequent urethroplasty, if necessary, becomes easier. All right? That's all it does. If you're lucky, you may be able to, depending on the type of axial injury, you may be able to make him stricture free with this. But there's no way of predicting that because the catheter did not go in the first place. So you're trying to attempt these operations under vision and therefore you, you have, depending on when you do it, you have these terms being used. All right? When you delayed, delayed, delayed means when the whole plaque is matured, the, everything is done, and then some people would call that a core through urethrotomy. That is quite different because you use the word cut through to light, and yes. that is why Dr. Prabhu had objection. Because cutting through is only when there is organized fibrosis. There is no organized fibrosis yet here. Right? There's a little lot of hematoma and soft tissue injury and everything else. If you open a patient with pelvic fracture trauma to do an open suprapubic cystostomy, you will realize that that whole area is gossamer. You know, it's all very fragile and, you know, lots of blood around there. You don't know what the anatomy looks like. It is a mess actually. All right. So this whole area, even endoscopically, you may find that you may go through the bladder neck and you will come out in the pelvic floor. And you will have to find the other area by a separate light. So a light on light situation and no cutting here. It's all very soft tissue. So no organized fibrosis takes place here. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, so these are all the operations that can be done endoscopically. And depending on the time that is done, you, you describe them. So this patient is very young, he's very concerned about his uh, erectile function. So you're planning a surgery for him. So what is he your take? He already said he doesn't get early morning to missiles. Yeah, he or his wife or his father-in-law, whatever, very concerned. They want to have a child. <laughs> And you are planning to do the surgery. What is the percentage of erectile dysfunction in a patient whom you do? Uh, 15 to 20 percent. Chances of erectile dysfunction is there. Uh, 15 to 20 percent. At the end of what time you are talking about? Over a period of what time? In the initial periods, the uh, erect with the passage of time, it will the erectile function improve or will it worsen? So when will you assess erectile function? With the and what will you counsel the patient about when he says three days after surgery I'm feeling well, but I'm not getting erections, or first visit he says I'm not getting erection? That's the time you need to counsel, and that's the time you may also need to start planning what to do. So, what happens to the erectile function? You are saying 30%. Does this number come down? Does this number go up? So, with passage, time? with passage of time, the erectile function may improve, sir. Uh, but uh, around, I take uh, a year or so uh, for uh, it to have a definite uh, sir, uh, result, if it will improve or not. Which brings us to the question then, which was asked last time also, why do these patients develop erectile function after the injury, dysfunction after the injury? 
Sir, most common reason is the injury to the nerves, sir. Uh, the cavernous uh, uh, nerves, sir. And the second is the injury to the uh, 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 penile artery, sir. Uh, those are the most common reasons for. Uh, Might be the most common, but what all can be the reasons? It will also have a bearing on the ultimate prognosis. Is there a difference between a five-year-old child and a 60-year-old man? Both of them can get pelvic fracture injury, isn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> In a child, uh, chances of uh, injury uh, extending to the bladder neck uh, through the prostatic urethra, urethra is more. Gaurav, yes, I sir. give you this hint because Dr. Mohan asked you what are the other factors. You just said nerve injury and arterial injury, isn't it? But could there be other factors also responsible for erectile dysfunction in a patient? The younger the child, the younger the patient, the more likely is it for him to have Recovery. All things being equal, we're not talking of the nature of the accident. There can be disastrous consequences in both people. A 60-year-old man may have atherosclerotic arteries. He may be diabetic. So these are other conditions which will impede erectile function from returning. Yes. Isn't it? So, yes, sir. So you have to think of all the possibilities. Let's move on to the MCO, please. Show the voiding sequence if there is. We saw this last time, actually. Yeah. Has anything changed, sir? You saw the urethrogram. Yes, sir. You saw the cystogram. Yes, sir. This is a voiding film. And yes, sir. And there is something strange. We had stopped at this juncture last time. The bladder neck. Dr. Ganesh had left you with the question Is there any way in which we can improve delineation of the prostatic urethra other than asking the patient to stream during an MCU? Uh, I'll digress slightly, but you'll get the point. Now, when somebody has severe urgency, but can't use the toilet, what do they do? They squeeze the pelvic floor muscles, put them into overdrive. And they don't, the bladder doesn't then give them that urge, it settles down for a few seconds or a couple of minutes. How does that happen? Is it only because the sphincter is squeezing the urethra or are there other mechanisms involved? And this also you'll have to read because it is again related to the question that I asked you about the muscular organization at the bladder neck. Okay. That's it. Yeah, fine. So now this is the MCU. Please proceed. Uh, the MCU uh, shows a elevated uh, bladder neck with a well distended bladder. The bladder neck is opening well, and the contrast can be seen uh, in the prostatic up till the prostatic urethra. You were advised to use certain specific terms. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. So where all are you finding the shouldering? The, the shouldering is uh, seen uh, at the bladder neck. Anywhere else? Sort of you must have seen many x-rays of patients who have had pelvic fracture. And does this look a little different to the standard ones? That's all. Try to put your clinical knowledge into every case that you see 
and say, does this look different? And this brings you to the question that I asked you first, what is the commonest type of injury that you get in PFUDD? Type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5A, five B, yeah? all that. That you must know. Then you'll be able to figure out as to why this X-ray is looking a little different. It's actually a very worrying situation if you look at this X-ray as it is. Percentage, I, I don't know so much. Let me put your mind at rest. <laughs> Does anybody else want to pitch in? I'm sure there are one or two final years also. Uh, unless they are busy studying on study leave. See, even if they are, I think they should interest them. Any right. of this could figure in their uh, exams. The theory exam. Okay. You see, the commonest type of injury is a type 3, which is an inframontane type of injury. So it occurs at the level of the pelvic floor. So by and large, most of the patients who have got this type of injury, when they actually void, you'll be able to see that prosthetic urethra a little bit dilated, and you will be probably able to see the verumontanum also as a filling defect in them. Okay? Yes, sir. In this particular case, if you look at it very carefully, you see two shoulders. You see the shouldering at the bladder neck, and you see another shoulder, which Mohan was trying to get you to understand. And you just see an abrupt cutoff at that point. It looks as though this is getting cut off at the top end of the prostate. Not at the apex, but literally at the base of the prostate. Prostatic urethra is how long? How long, is huh? how long is a prostatic urethra? Normally? Two to three centimeters. Okay. And therefore, if you look at this, only be seeing a little, little bit of, of the prostatic urethra there. You're not seeing the entire prostatic urethra. So are we looking at a very serious injury? If you look at all these bone and fragments which are sitting there, have they crushed all this? Or is it just an artifact or this fellow has not been able to do a voiding? So when you see a picture like this, you should attempt once again to see if you can encourage this fellow to void better. Yes, sir. You know, and rather than asking him to strain, you give him a little time and say, when you feel like passing urine, try and pass urine. Because any straining, any increase in tone of the pelvic floor also sends inhibitory impulses through the sacral nucleus to the detrusor. That is the mechanism by which voiding is postponed. Not just the physical squeeze, but also the negative neural feedback. So it may just be that at this point, his blood is getting inhibited, he's not voiding. Tell him to relax and void when he feels like it. I can also see a hand kept on his anterior abdominal wall which again changes the voiding dynamics completely. Uh, Is this the only film we have? Yes. So if you look at this patient's gapometry index, what do you think is going to happen? So, uh, he, will, he will need uh, the, uh, it's a complex injury, uh, the primary anastomosis uh, doesn't uh, won't be feasible, sir. It will be a difficult anastomosis. Prim it will be feasible. It, you can't say it won't be feasible. It will be feasible with an elaborated approach. And you'll be surprised that if you do just maybe an inferior pubectomy, you may be able to get that urethra. So you should be prepared for the eventuality of doing a formal transpubic abdominal penile in patients like this. Because you can never predict just by looking at it. And this is where probably the MRI scores over standard x-rays like this. Yes, sir. Exactly where the levels are. This gapometry index was measured with the help of the MRI. Yes. When, when Mr. Corentum started all this drama. All right. So that's how it is. What is progressive perineal approach? Yeah. Uh, progressive, uh, it's a uh, 
the primary uh, urethral uh, uh, posterior urethral anastomosis uh, uh, in which uh, to get an extra length of uh, the uh, bulbar urethra we uh, have uh, certain maneuvers as in the dissection of the bulbar urethra then followed by the corpolar splitting uh, which gives an extra 2 cm of length uh, we, then uh, the next uh, approach is uh, the inferior pubectomy which gives extra mm. 2 cm there are four steps described Go in order. Go in the sequence. So, uh, first the step is mobilization of the bulbar urethra. Agreed. What is the, the second step? Se second is corporal splitting, sir. Corporal no, you corporal. can't split the corpora at this stage. Oh, you refer to that as corporal splitting. Okay, fine. The uh, call it corporal separation. It's the, not splitting. It's separation. Corporal yeah. separation. You don't split it. You don't. When I, you say corporal splitting, it means that. You're cutting, you know, the, each corporal ca corp uh, corporal body is being split. No, you go between the two corporal cavernosa, so you actually separate. So, yes, sir. Uh, the third is the uh, inferior pubectomy, for, uh, and the fourth step is the corporal uh, de rooting, sir. Re rooting, re rooting through the corporal bodies. Plural bodies. Some examiners may be a little particular. They may say it's not just bulbar mobilization, it is complete bulbar mobilization, which means that you mobilize the urethra right up to the penoscotal junction. The whole bulbar urethra, right up from where the accident takes place as a perineal membrane, right up to penoscotal junction, so that you have got that part of the urethra completely mobilized. And then all these procedures can take place one after the other, finally going on to a formal transpubic approach. Yes. Right? Yes, sir. Whose name does this go by, man? Uh, uh, sir, uh, Webs. Webster. Yeah, yeah. Webster. Correct, yes. George Webster. Yeah, okay. What shall we call it at the 9th uh, what is paratum triad? Paratum triad. Uh, it's the uh, adequate. Uh, it's the uh, anastomosis uh, uh, principles of repair of the urethral uh, uh, urethroplasty, in which uh, there is uh, adequate uh, callus uh, excision and uh, mucosa to mucosa approximation, and then tension-free mucosa anastomosis. Paratum stride included mucosal eversion. Step that many people don't do, but when Coratum described it, it was mucosal eversion. Watertight mucosal to mucosal anastomosis is also added on as part of that particular triad. Okay? Yes. Okay, right, then I think we've reached time. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll Thank catch you up sir. next week. Stay safe.